title of the message this morning is The Word of God is Your Sword. The Word of God is Your Sword. I want to make it clear today that your tongue is not your sword. Facebook and social media is not your sword. The pen might well be mightier than the sword. That's when it's applied right. But certainly Facebook and social media oftentimes is not applied right. The word of God is your sword. Paul tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but that they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's talking about satanic and demonic strongholds. The word of God is powerful enough to pull down satanic and demonic strongholds. Doesn't need any help from any one of us, just needs us to apply it, to believe it and to trust it. And I wanna show you this morning that the Word of God is a sword and that the Word of God is a sword that needs to be applied right. I wonder how many people here remember doing the sword drill when you were, uh, used to be children's meetings, youth meetings and so on. Don't know they ever did it in, in adults' meetings, but, but they would do what they called the sword drill. That, that we used to take the Bible, we're told to take the Word of God, put it under our arm, and then you were given a, 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 the, the name of a book and a chapter and verse, and then the teacher said, go, and you went and you opened up and you got, and the first person got there, they were able to read the verse out and they got a point and so on. That was what was called sword drill. That's how some people use the Bible, just to get the verse, see what it says, and then that's it. Maybe even learn it and able to quote it, and that's okay to do. But the important thing is that we get to the point where we apply God's Word to our lives. Several weeks ago in one of our prayer meetings, I felt the need to ask the question, why do we need a sword? Why do we need a sword? And I asked this question because in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul said, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, it's His sword but it is the Word of God. Well, what does Paul tell us? He tells us to take the sword of the Spirit. Take it. This is His sword. This is a sword that belongs to the Spirit of God, but we are told to take it, to take hold of that sword. Why? Because we obviously need it, but here's the question I asked on the Tuesday night, and this was not me having prepared a message. This was during the prayer time. This was not me... Given him, it was just I felt the need to ask this question. Why do we need a sword? And if we're told to take the sword of the Spirit, we need to ask the question, why? Why do we need a sword? Oh, we know that we need the Bible because it gives us information about God. We know that we need to read the Word of God because it tells us about creation. It tells us about life. It tells us about death. It tells us about eternity. This is our spiritual food. This is what helps us to grow. This is what helps us to mature. But why do we need it as a sword? And that's the question I was asking on the Tuesday night. And the answer that I gave, it just took a few moments. I wasn't preaching like this. Just during the prayer time, why do we need a sword? And we need a sword because we are in a battle. We are in a battle. Every person in this room is in a battle. Every member of your family, they're in a battle. Every person in our community, they are in a battle. And I wonder who among us today does not feel like 
that's your situation, that's your circumstances. It does not feel like you're in a battle. I think every one of us, you know that when you examine your life, you look at what you're going through, you know you're in a battle. Well, there are battles going on right across this room. Homes and families, there are battles going on. Some of you are fighting battles that no one knows anything about. You're fighting those battles in silence. People don't see the tears. They don't hear the frustration. And you fight those battles in secret. But everyone in this room, you're fighting battles. Some are fighting battles that cannot be hid. Some in this room, some in this church, you've lost children. You've lost a wife. You've lost a husband, a father, a mother. I've lost three brothers. There used to be four of us. Now there's only myself and my sister. My mother and my father, they're gone. We all know what it's like to fight those battles. And if you don't quite yet, unfortunately, you will at some stage. Some of you are fighting the battle against sickness that may be your own personal sickness, maybe someone in your home And you pray for them every day and every night. But you're still fighting that battle. Some are fighting financial pressures. And there's a battle. There's a battle that's raging in homes and individual lives and your circumstances. There are battles raging in our communities. And the battles that we fight in our community are not battles imposed on us by anyone else. We don't need Catholics to come across the wall to fight us on the Shankill Road. We're doing it okay ourselves. The Catholic community doesn't need the pros to attack them. They're doing it themselves. We don't need immigrants, whether they're illegal or legal. And yes, we want legal immigrants to come to this country. But we don't need them to cause us to fight. We're fighting without them. Well, we want someone to blame And that's what we do. But we're fighting battles. Battles that are coming from within. I don't know what it's been like to fight those battles. We've given up our home to young people that we've rescued at times in the past. Literally saved lives. Some who were kids on the Shankill Road going back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And in our life, they didn't have families because Kathleen McKay and Jack McKay stepped in. Drove to their home sometimes, got them out, put them in the back of the car, drove them past the very men who were out looking for them. Buried young men in our community, not killed by the other side. Yes, we buried some who were killed by the other side. But even within our own community, we buried those who were killed by those within our community. We have nothing to learn from anyone else. We've done so much damage to ourselves. There's a battle that's going on, a battle going on for the lives of young people, a battle going on for the lives of men and women. I'm burying a 33-year-old on Wednesday coming. I prayed with him on the phone over a year ago. I led him to faith in Christ over the phone. Encouraged him to get out to a church, to get along somewhere because of where he was living, because he had to leave this community. Not long after a prayer for him, he was sent for and brought back to this community and stuff happened. And yeah, there were issues going on in his life, drugs and so on. But I now get, I now get to bury him this coming Wednesday, 33 years of age. There are battles going on for the lives of young people. There are battles going on for the lives of men, women, and children, for young people in your family, for people in your family situation as well. There are battles raging even against marriages and against families. Some of you have made it by the grace of God. Your marriage is still intact because God was able to intervene. Some of you, no, I'd say most of you, maybe even all of you, In this room today, you're fighting battles. We're all fighting battles. God's given us a sword to fight the battle with. Oh, I know the battle belongs to the Lord. How often 
Has, have Christians sung that song? How often have we sung that? The battle belongs to the Lord, so we'll rise up in heavenly armor and we'll fight that battle. I know that the land of the tribe of Judah is roaring with, roaring with power and he's fighting our battles. I know that. We sing it. We believe it. But here's the kick, friends. We're still in the battle. We're still fighting the battle. How often have you sung those songs? How often have you jumped up and down and danced before the Lord, but you go through those doors and you're still fighting the battle? Colin, I didn't know you're in, brother. God bless you. Didn't know you're in. Bless you. Still fighting the battles. I know that God makes us stronger. How often have we sung that? That God makes us stronger. And that in him we win every battle, do we? We sing that in this church and many other churches. And I know that we sing it and we believe it with all of our hearts that in him we are strong and in him he helps us to win every battle. But we're still in the battle. We're still fighting the battle. We all know how the how the story ends. Most of you as believers, you've read to the end of the book, you've got to the end and you've read, you know how it ends. And we know who wins. But until that day dawns, we are still in the battle. And that's why we need the sword. Because we're in a battle. Paul would not tell us to take a sword or take the sword of the Spirit. He wouldn't refer to it to refer to the word of God as a sword if he didn't think for one second that we were not in the battle. He knew that as believers we were and we would be. In fact, taking the sword of the Spirit is not all that Paul says we need. In Ephesians 6 verse 13, um, we don't have it on the screen, but he says to put on the full armor of God, put on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, make your feet ready with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith. And then he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to tell you, friends, Paul is not expressing a lack of faith here. He's simply telling us, you're in a battle. You're in a battle. And it's important for all of us to know, maybe some need to know this more than others, that you're not the only one who's in a battle. See, some of you get wrapped up in all the stuff, and I know it's painful at times, but you get wrapped up in your circumstances and you think it's only me that's going through this situation. You're not the only one in a battle. The person sitting next to you is fighting the battle. You might not know what that is, but they're fighting the battle. The person sitting in front of you is fighting a battle. The person sitting behind you is fighting a battle. Every person in this room, they are fighting battles. But here's what we do. When we put on the armor of God, as Paul says we should, and when we take the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit, we get up and we go again. We get up and we go again. We don't let the battle defeat us. We don't let the enemy defeat us. We don't let the devil put us down. But we take the sword of the Spirit and we get up and we go again. And every time we face a setback, we're looking for the comeback and we get up and we go again. We do so for ourselves. We do so for our families. We do so for our community. And we do so for the church. We get up and we go again. So that no matter how much the battle rages, we keep advancing and we keep taking back what the enemy's stolen from us. That's what we do as Christians. We don't sit back in this old poor little old me pity party. And we recognize the situations, the circumstances, the trials, the challenges. We recognize the battles that people are facing. But we get up and we go again because we take the sword of the Spirit. Jude, the brother of Jesus. Little book right at the very, uh, just before you get to Revelation, Jude, Revelation, just one chapter. Jude urges us to contend for the faith. He says, contend for the faith that was entrusted to us. Contend for it. Fight for it. That's what he's saying. Fight for it. Fight for it. Contend for it. 
But he's not talking about fighting the way the world fights. He's telling us to acknowledge you're on a battle here. You're on a fight here. And you need the sword of the Spirit in order to contend for the faith. He didn't say go and preach a sermon about it. He didn't say go and write a song about it. But he said you stand up and you contend for the faith. You contend for it. Fight for it, Paul said. Paul didn't only talk about it, Paul did it. Did it to the point where he said, I have fought a good fight. Facing death, he looks back in his life and he says, I know that I fought a good fight. And he did so not with carnal weapons, not with Facebook, not with calling people names, but he did so with the sword of the Spirit. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, you want someone to follow? Follow Jesus. That's what you should be doing anyway. When Jesus was tempted and tested by the devil, Jesus used the sword of the Spirit. He responded to the devil every time the devil came at him. It is written. It is written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall not tempt, you shall not test the Lord your God. He used the sword of the Spirit in order to put the devil to flight. I want to tell you, friends, we need to keep speaking God's Word over our lives and our circumstances. We need to use this book, this Word, as the sword of the Spirit over our lives, over our family. And when the devil has a go at us, we need to take that sword of the Spirit, just as Jesus did, and we need to put the devil to flight because the devil is the enemy of all of us. He's the enemy of all of us. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If it has flesh on it, doesn't matter what the color is. If it's flesh on it, it's not your enemy. I'm not going to go down the road of expanding this, but I just feel I need to say this. There were times when people in this country felt they needed to get up and go to another country. America wouldn't exist today had people in Europe not done so. Maybe this country wouldn't exist today had people not come from Europe to here. Some of you think you're true blue Irish. Although some of you are British, Irish, and that's okay. Your ancestors came from somewhere beyond this island. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If it has flesh on it, the Bible's saying it's not your enemy. If the blood running through their veins, Paul is saying they're not your enemy. Your enemy is someone who stands up and comes against you. Then you stand up against them and right to do so. But the Word of God makes it clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against spiritual wickedness in high places. My apology for going to be a bit over time because of that stupid thing earlier. Let me make a final point. The sword of the Spirit cuts both ways. It cuts both ways. Just give me a few moments, I'm going to finish. This is not just about coming against the enemy of our souls and the devil is the enemy of every person in this room. But this is not just a weapon to come against the enemy of our souls. This cuts both ways. It also comes against whatever's in us that hinders us from advancement. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword that penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The word of God does that. So if you read this word right, it'll challenge you. If you apply this word right, it will change you. See, it's not just about the other person, whoever that other person is. This is about you. If you apply this word right, it will challenge you. If you apply this word right, it will change you. 
This is not just about telling someone else what you think is written for them and about them. This is about what you're telling you, what's written here for you. It's a double-edged sword. It helps us to come against the enemy, but it helps us to cut out those things in our lives that are truly not of God. And finish in a few seconds. Worship team, you can come to the platform, please. This is the sword of the Spirit. We're told to take the sword of the Spirit. Why are we told to take the sword of the Spirit? Because we're in a battle. Every person in this room is in a battle. Every person. There's not a person in this room today who does not face things in life during the week and you're coming up to Sunday to get out to church and sometimes you're facing challenges that want to stop you from getting out to church. Maybe sometimes you face stuff that wants you to go back into the world. Pack it all in, just give it all up because you're in a battle. Some of you got out this morning, it was hard to get through the door. But you did it, you made it, you got to church today. We're in a battle and we're told to take the sword of the Spirit because Paul recognizes we're all fighting the battle. And taking the sword of the Spirit will help us in so many ways. But most importantly, you take the sword of the Spirit, you apply it to your life and your circumstances. Whatever comes against you, you will be able to stand against it. And it'll help you win the battle. It might not always turn out the way you want it to. Man, if I could do things in my life, there's things I would change right away. But we're still fighting the battle. We're still changing or taking the sword of the Spirit. I believe it's important that you take this book, you take this word, that you use it to help you win the battles, that you use it often, that you use it well, that you use it wisely, but use it. Use it. And remember this, it cuts both ways. It's not just using it against someone, it cuts both ways. And you apply the Word of God to other people's lives, that's okay. You apply it to your own life, that's when you see the real change. I really believe this is what God wants me to do. Dixon, come on up with me, brother. Come on, stand here. Dora, come up as well. Just stand here. I need six other black people to come and join us because you're going to serve us communion. Black is not an insulting term. Some of us call ourselves white. Some of us call ourselves white, but we're pink and red and all sorts of shades and colors. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They didn't sneak off a boat somewhere and go and take somebody's house in the shackle. Dixon, you're here 20 years right now anyway, yeah? You tried to take my job, but it didn't work. <laughs> but these are our brothers and sisters. And they came to the same Christ that we came to. Have we got eight here? Let's count. Do we need another one? Need another two? All right, another couple of people. Come on and join us. Come on ahead, brother. Feel free, please. Yes, come on ahead. That's it. Bless you. These are our brothers and sisters of Christ. They're going to serve us communion. Turn around and face me, folks. Just... We're going to be.
I'm going to ask four of our white women <laughs> and four of our white men, you come up four, let's, let's have eight people, four women, four men. Come on ahead. That's it. Come on ahead. Four white women, four. I'm using the word white. I don't even like using that word white, but there you go. I want you four, you eight, there's eight, should be eight of you. you. You come up and take a plate each and take, a, take one of these each because you're going to hand them out. This is not planned. You can see that. One of you guys up, you're going to take this. So hold, hold on a second. Wait a second. Let's, let's just do it all together. So we're going to serve the bread first of all. They're going to serve the bread across the line and then we'll serve uh, the cup. Um, yeah, so we'll serve it out at the front first. And then we're going to ask you um, to serve it out to the people here within the church, okay? So, Father, we just want to thank you for this moment. Totally unplanned. But we love our brothers and sisters here. We pray your blessing upon them. And as we pray for them, we're praying for our community. We're praying for our nation, Lord. We know we don't get it right. We don't get it right. We mess up. But help us, Lord in the church to be the church to love one another to do what is right what needs to be done to set an example for others and so I want to just pray that as we partake of these emblems you did not die for white people for black people for red and all sorts of other colors and mixtures you died for sinful humanity and so we acknowledge that today we thank you for that so we thank you for the, for the emblems what they represent Bless this bread to us that's broken for us. Bless this cup to us that reminds us of your precious blood. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Just serve the bread out there first, please. Just serve the bread first. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, for this is my body which is broken for, the, for you. Let's do in remembrance of me. You serve the cup as well, please. After they had eaten, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink you of it for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you just show the Lord's death till he come. Thank you, Lord. today thank you Lord Jesus 